This episode of Lane Podcast is a previous client that I had the opportunity to work with. It's Phil Tuttle, and we talk about how he navigated the current land market, how he ended up finding a parcel that made sense, fit his goals. We talk about that entire process from start to finish. So if you're looking to buy your first piece of ground, listen to Phil's experience, and I hope you learned something from it. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Let's get right into it. Here we go. Phil, man, how's it going? Great, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks so much for hopping on here. This is the first time land buyers episode, and it's uh, it's one that is really cool because I helped throughout the process. But before we get into uh, your story and everything else, but just give yourself a little bit of an introduction for everyone here listening. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Phil Tuttle, 32 years old. I live in Chicagoland suburbs here, and I've got a wife, uh, Erica, and four awesome kids. We've got five and a half, three and a half, almost two and almost 12 weeks so we are mad man <laughs> a full quiver yeah <laughs> for sure man and uh yeah i love to hunt i love to fish and originally grew up in atlanta georgia and uh, have been hunting on other people's properties for 18 years and making it happen and grateful for those chances but just really looking forward to having a place to call my own and so now up here in the midwest with work and uh, my wife's family lives up here. So this is where, where we're at long-term. So thank goodness that there's giant deer up here. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not Georgia. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's not sure. Georgia. And yeah. so, um, no, that's that's really awesome. And I think, what about, uh, how long have you wanted to buy a piece of ground? Is that something that rooted in back in Georgia or was that something that happened once you moved up here and, and didn't have as much access? Yeah, I mean, like like you hear people say, oh, I, I never thought I'd be able to afford that, or I never thought that that would be realistic for me. But the desire was there since I would say high school, when I really got serious and first bought a bow. Uh, always thought, man, it'd be cool to have a place of my own that I didn't have to go ask a buddy or knock on a door or work a connection for a piece of ground. But it, it didn't become real or a reality for me, uh, really, until I kind of started listening to this podcast and some other resources out there mm -hmm. and realized like this is this is doable. Yeah, it is really surprising how doable it really is because I think for a lot of people it's just it feels like a goal that's not achievable unless you come through a, a windfall of cash of, you know, some sort of luck that, you know, you can put in parentheses, but then yeah. you can put a methodical plan together and do it. I mean, that's the that's the beauty of it. That's the that's the awesome thing and that's where a lot of the guests like yourself here today kind of walking through that process of, oh, this is, you know, it is pretty straightforward. This is all you have to do. Um, for sure. Has that been, was that surprising for you? Like once you actually said, okay, I'm, I'm really serious. I'm going to look. Did you think that the process was easier or harder than what you think? And there may be different chapters of this too. <laughs> I mean, I'm a pretty calculated guy. So I, uh, paralysis by analysis, everything generally speaking, uh -huh. And so I think the only roadblock was myself. And I mean, having you as a resource, uh, the land podcast, a couple other podcasts that are out there, uh, I knew that it was possible. And once I got the ball rolling, it was easier than I thought it would be. I mean, finding a, a piece of ground that was a good deal and buying it right was mm -hmm. the hardest part. Yeah. Uh, and then kicking yourself into action and all right, got to call the bank. All right. Got to check in with Jake. And yeah, just moving the ball down the field. Yeah, for sure. And I, I would say it, it's, it was a very interesting chapter of, uh, of land buying too, during, when you're, you're shopping yeah. too, because it was like, we were coming off a really hot market and I would still say it's stable by all means, but, um, there was this limited inventory, but, and we'll talk about that later. But, um, one thing that we kind of <clears throat> hopped over is what do you do? It's always good for the first time land buyer episodes. Like, what do you do for a living? Uh, do you work on the New York Stock Exchange? I mean, what do you do here? <laughs> Thankfully, I do not. Uh, yeah, I'm a restaurant owner. So a small business owner here in the Chicagoland suburbs. And I have a good bit of flexibility and super grateful for that. It's it's good for spending time with my family. And obviously, come October and November, uh, it, ha it definitely has its perks as well. Yeah, for sure. And just walk a little bit through your journey of how you ended up became a, a restaurant owner here, you know, and you're 32 years old now. Yeah, sure. So I started out just as like a frontline employee team member um, and, and worked my way up and got an internship um, at the at the corporate office and made some connections and learned about franchising. Uh, and then it was, again, kind of like uh, buying land seems like something that nobody could do or something that nobody could afford, um, but realized that that wasn't the case and just kind of grinded 
uh, after college and worked with the company for seven years, um, eventually had a chance to open a franchise. And so we were in Nebraska for three years, um, running, running a franchise as well. And now we're um, here in Chicagoland. Mm-hmm. So just honestly making the next right move and grinding it out. And yeah, that's M- making the leap. Of yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. What was it? What was it like running or working in that restaurant in Nebraska versus Chicagoland? Is volume that much uh, different? Volumes were similar. Uh, everybody cheers for one team. So the Huskers, it's like, I mean, the entire state is Huskers and that's it. Huskers and Creighton basketball. And so, uh, yeah, I would just say it's a different, um, Omaha is very different than Chicagoland in, in many, many ways. And, and we loved it out there. Hunting opportunities were fantastic oh, yeah. in Nebraska. Yeah. And we miss, yeah. we miss it in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, you went, you went back to Nebraska this last fall, right? Yeah. Man, we go up. every, yeah. So that was awesome. I, I'm not gonna, I can't share, uh, I can't share <laughs> pins or anything like that, but I'll be back <laughs> at that. Jake, I'll be back at that same spot. This, uh, this gun season, I promise you that. So we go back, uh, shout out to my Georgia buddies, um, from back home. We go out to Nebraska, uh, or Missouri every year and do a week long rifle trip. And we're all pretty burned out with the bow by about November 13th or so. And so we, we whip out the big guns and go out there and just honestly have a blast. It's, That's it's cool. as much about community as it is killing big deer. And so I was able to take a real nice buck on a piece of public, uh, last year in Nebraska that was not on anyone's radar and it gnarly, happened fast. Gnarly yeah. Buck. He's at the taxi. So hopefully we get him back soon. <laughs> no, that's yeah. awesome. And that's something that I realized working with you directly is the camaraderie or the community is really important with you. And I think oh, uh, yeah. that was something that, that played a part into basically top to bottom of the parcel you ended up uh, purchasing. But when yep. you were looking and, and you were looking for a while, I think the first time we talked was probably December of 21. Would that sound right? Or maybe 22? Yeah. Th- 20. You launched you launched Land Podcast in 21. Uh-huh. And I binged like all the episodes that were out there. And then I'm like, I need to reach out to this guy. And so that had to have been 22 probably. Okay. Like December of, no, December of 21 going into 22. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sure. That sounds right. And so, yep. you know, at that point, would you say you're pretty serious at looking or were you still kind of in the process of learning more and developing a plan? Man, I think until you've got a pre-approval letter, like, are you actually serious? And so- Fair, fair. I love that. <laughs> I just keep it a real, I mean, I was serious. I wasn't wasting your time and I, I've tried to be intentional about that. Oh yeah. Um. But until I really had that pre-approval, I, yeah, I I was serious, but it wasn't like, okay, I've had my credit checked. Okay, you know, I've done the steps to get that done. So probably mm-hmm. um, midway through 2021 is when I was like, on the trigger mm-hmm. if the right property came along. So, and that's back when rates were so low. Yeah. So maybe should have, maybe should have pulled the trigger back then. I was just talking to someone about that yesterday. It's those, those are just like the, <laughs> on this episode, I remember saying, I asked a lender, I was like, are we in what's considered the golden age of interest rates in your opinion? Like, and obviously I felt the answer was yes. He's like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I don't think, and now we're, you know, they just raised the Fed just raised 25 basis points yesterday. Probably going to get more in September. It's just hindsight's 2020, but that's where it's, I think it's uh, all these guests that we talk to here and especially the guys that have been in this space for 20, 30 years, it's very, it's almost weird because they all don't talk to each other, but their advice is almost unanimous. If you find the farm that you like and you can afford it, buy it. And it's like, oh, is, is that simple? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think it goes back to, I mean, this is similar with real estate, right? Date the rate and marry the property. Yep. And there's refi options available. Uh, the banker that you hooked me up with has been great. And I have a high degree of confidence that there'll be flexibility there depending mm-hmm. on what happens. Uh, and so, you know, we'll get into the rate later or we'll get into the, the financing later of it, but I, yeah, it, it, once you find that spot, especially if you're buying right and it has some of those long-term benefits and you think you can sell it, I mean, why not? Why wait? Yeah, for sure. And so what was, what was on your punch list or your checklist of what this property had to have? And, and maybe you filled up a whole piece of paper there. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you and I went back and forth, text, email, and like you were such a help with helping me rank some of these things. Number one, I think proximity is huge. So it's 45 minutes from my front door. 
Mm-hmm. And Chicago land is obviously, and I'm taking your word for this, it, it's got to be a huge buyer pool. And so for to be that close to where we are, I'd never thought that that was possible. So it's 45 minutes from my front door. Uh, so I can, I can hunt mornings and get to work or leave work early and hunt evenings in the future, hopefully pick up my kids from school and go hop in a blind together. Uh, and then it's, it's about a, uh, a mile and a quarter from one of my good buddies farms has a big farm that we hunt together uh, that kind of serves as HQ for a group of friends. And so being a, a mile from there is awesome because I can hunt my spot and then we can get together afterwards and grab a bite to eat or whatever. So proximity is absolutely leads that leads the way. Uh, and I, and, and with that, having that knowledge of the area, right. I, I know there's sure. good bucks around. There is high hunting pressure, but I, I, I kind of know what I'm getting into. I don't think I'm going to be shocked with um, what kind of deer in the area. And then after that, uh, price, I, you could look at the price that I paid per acre and it was a, a little over six K per acre. And when you first hear that, you're like, you paid what for rec grand rec land. And, but for the area, man, like I, I honestly think, uh, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts here on this, but I think we got it for 10 to 20% under, under market for the area, uh, just I based would, on. Yeah. I would say 10% for sure. And then the other thing too, is the, the cash run on that parcel was extremely low. Um, yeah. so, you know, getting the cash rent to market rent, or if you decide to enroll it into CRP, mm-hmm. I mean, that's going to increase, I mean, that in itself is going to increase the value and then just the proximity to where it's at as well. I mean, yeah, I felt, I felt confident after, I mean, online, I felt like we went back and forth on a bunch of properties and this was one that mm-hmm. once we walked, I was like, this is, this is a good deal. Well, yeah, I had walked it in December of 2022 and then you had kind of said, Hey, let me know what you think and holidays and everything came and went. And then uh, you reached out again. You're like, "Hey, are you still thinking about that piece?" And I was like, "You know," and we were looking at a house, almost bought a house. Yeah, this, that, and the other. And thank, thank the Lord that fell through. Um, but then you were like, "You want to go walk that farm again?" And I'm like, "Yeah, we probably should." So then, when you and I saw it together, the snow had melted off. The deer mm-hmm. sign was really evident. And I think by the time we got back to the trucks, I for sure knew it was just a matter of what the number was going to be on the offer. And I think we both kind of knew all right, like I, I know what good deer sign looks like. You're just verifying what I, what I already mm-hmm. thought I knew. So, yeah. And what I liked about that parcel too, was <clears throat> there's a good chunk of, uh, of income that had, I would say good access. You could hunt it on a mm-hmm. lot of predominant wins. Oh yeah. And then you could leave the back part of the property alone and not feel bad about it either. And it's like, and based off what, like talking with what your goals were, it's like, I feel confident this farm can achieve your goals and then probably exceed them once you, you know, do the things that we talked about too. I think so. I still haven't been west of the creek. So since I bought it. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, eventually I will and maybe put in some trails, but it really is going to be a true sanctuary over there and try to leave it alone. So. Yeah. And so the biggest, so the biggest things was proximity, price, and well, yeah. Also it's within one hour of a major Metro area, one of the biggest metros in the entire country. And so I don't know if this is a word, but sellability and exit strategy, like I'm pretty confident we can take uh, what I think was a very poorly marketed advertised property that we bought right mm-hmm. and either keep it forever or, you know, three to five years, be able to sell it as a turnkey place. And I know you're going to make a bang up listing with trail mm-hmm. camera photos, harvest photos, drone shots just some of those ones you see on those websites that look so sharp i i, mm-hmm. I think we're kind of taking a you know a property that didn't have that on the front end and then mm-hmm. we could potentially sell it as a turnkey to somebody who doesn't have the time to do what we're doing yeah absolutely and i this i, I that agent was great to work with but i'll just say this the way oh, yeah. the sure. way the way it was syndicated was an issue um this mm-hmm. is speaking matter of factly basically it was uh they were using a service that would go on there. And then it was like an agent in Miami that I don't know how it worked out, but it was like some sort of service to where they could get on the MLS, but they weren't on the MLS and they weren't the direct contact. And so it was a pain. Like I had to do some, some data mining on the internet to get to to where I needed to go. And we did it, but it's like, how many, how many agents are going to do that for their client? Number two, how many potential buyers are going to go through that hassle before they just get frustrated and be like, "Ah, I don't, I don't really care that much. I mean, yeah, this deal kind of stretched out for a while and I don't know how into that we'll get, but I I just had a loose grip the whole time, man. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If not, then there's always another property, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I mean, we can, we can get into it, but it was, I mean, it was on 
one website, I think. Yeah. And like a fringe, not even a land website, like where you'd go to find a house or rent an apartment. Yep. And that's all I'll say. And that's exactly what I was looking for is mm-hmm. something that was like overlooked, you know, not super greatly advertised for deer hunting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I think, uh, I always say the the less competition you have with buyers inherently, the better deal you will likely get because, you know, oh, yeah. and, which, and yeah, we could definitely dive into the, the weirdness of this deal. <laughs> so God, I didn't hear deeper, but <laughs> oh, yeah, Jake, I'm sitting in church, uh, like way after the fact. And I, I see some texts come in and I, I show the phone to my wife and it's like, are you still interested in that piece? <laughs> and she looks over me. I just grin and like start sweating. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then she slaps me to put my phone away, I'm sure. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So um let's just talk let's talk about some of the farms that you decided that that weren't what you wanted and 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 what was the key thing that it wasn't the farm. Was it typically proximity or I would say that was probably the majority of it because you were looking you had a pretty big radius at, at one point. Yeah. We were so kind of within yeah, two and a half hours of Chicago land. And that included uh, you know, I I would even venture up into Wisconsin long-term for like down the road, probably, but within two and a half hours of Chicagoland suburbs and uh, yeah, proximity was the reason why we cut some of those other ones out of the mix. And that we looked at two others seriously and they just had some access issues Yeah, uh, was one of the main reasons. And being your first farm, I kind of wanted to cut out as many unknown variables as possible. And I'm somebody who kind of runs to like the safer option, just, it's my personality. And so this yeah. farm being so close to my buddy, I mean, a mile and a quarter from a really good buddy who's been That's a mentor. Huge. He's a mentor and like a great guy and can, it can save me from a lot of heartache and tell me which things I need to buy or don't need to buy. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like training wheels almost. Uh, yeah. So Dave, if you're listening, love you, man. And <laughs> appreciate the help. Yeah. And I think that's really important too. Cause even, uh, you, I mean, you guys can do project together. You can help him on his farm. He can help you on your farm. Yeah. And then, uh, and like you said before, like camaraderie of hunting your Nebraska trips, like that's really what it's about. And to have a friend that sure. close is r- pretty rare. I mean, the kind of doesn't happen too often. Oh, when I see a buddy shoot a good buck, man, I, I as excited or more excited and it really gets me jacked up. And I, so that's what it's all about. Yeah. Now, now you can buzz over there. Uh, Oh, yeah. You'll be right there. You'll be right there a mile away. <laughs> yeah. Yep. In fact, last year I, I let I let a, a really nice eight slip by me and he walked right to my buddy and my buddy just made a great <laughs> shot. And it was a, a good example of like I kind of blew it on a on a big deer over at my buddy's <laughs> farm and and he did not blow it. So <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So um how long did you say you actually shopped? So what would you say mm-hmm. two years, a year? Yeah, 15 months, plus or minus. Uh-huh. Yeah. From when you and I contacted each other to when we, you know, had a closing date. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. And then how before before you got in contact with me, were you working with a agent at all or were you just kind of just looking around and just perusing the internet? No, I think I called one guy that I saw on a billboard or a, off something off land watch, but it didn't um I wasn't pre-approved and so it, nothing really came together. It was more so like, Hey, let me just kind of dip my toe in the water uh-huh. and go with, you know, if, if they had shown a ton of intentionality and, and sought me, then I probably would have gone further. But then man, mm-hmm. it was, it was January, 2022. We're driving home to Georgia for a week with my family. And that's when I found your podcast. Mm-hmm. And man, like I said, I binged all the episodes that were, cool. uh, I mean, seriously, like the AirPods in the whole way, like, and it was at the end of that drive that my wife and I were like, it, it's just a matter of like when, not uh-huh. if. Yeah. Cause I was just blown away by some of the content on the episodes and I was so pumped. Yeah. I, I, I try not to take for granted, like some of the quality conversations that have been on here that I feel that have been, I don't think necessarily gatekeep before. I don't think it was intentional, but there just wasn't the platform for some of these people to, uh, share their stories and success. And I think a lot of it was almost like mythology. Like you hear about it, like, Oh, so-and-so owns a good chunk of ground. And then, you know, then oh, yeah. the other person has to throw in like a backhanded bash after that. Like, well, yeah, it's because of this, but like, th- here's their story. And like, they're not that much different than anyone else. They just did it for a long period of time and, and, and had a plan and stuck to it. 
Oh yeah. I mean like a couple of my favorite episodes, Nick Scalma, obviously I could listen to that guy talk and he was on another podcast a little bit after yours. And it was like, I mean, I've probably listened to that episode three times. Yeah. And, and then the, the 68 year old gentleman carpenter, I think from Wisconsin, man, just hearing his passion for it. And I, I, I'm, you know, half his age, but like his story and his passion for it aligned so clearly with mine. I never would have known that or heard his story. Yep. And his journey with Pike County, man, that that had me so jacked up to s- just start and get the ball rolling. Yeah, I was just thinking that guy yesterday, actually. Uh, ironically, I was thinking, <laughs> but when like we were going back and forth, I was thinking of some past guests. I also thought we need to get Nick Nick back on here for another episode. Um, oh, please do. Okay, so we'll just do that then. <laughs> I'll reach out yeah, to him. He, we'll get him. I could listen to. I mean, and the whole uh, land contract. I haven't done that yet, and it's uh-huh. fascinating to me. And I think it's got to be right place, right situation. But that's just mm-hmm. another like nobody. I doubt anybody's doing that. Very few, yeah. <clears throat> Especially on large deals, I I see and hear of that on smaller tracks, like something that maybe mm-hmm. costs twenty to fifty thousand dollars. But on big tracks, it's usually pretty rare. And I think uh, honestly, contract for deed or land contracts now with interest rates. Um, I mean, I think that what we'll, we'll just have to get him on here and get his opinion because <laughs> he that thinks experience. outside the box. Yeah, yeah, he thinks outside the box so well. Yeah, absolutely. So you were talking a little bit about uh, you were, when you're riding to Georgia. <clears throat> mm. It was like you and your wife made a mutual decision that when, it's not a matter if it's a matter of when. So has she been on the same page and are encouraging along the way of like, do it? Yeah, man. Quick shout out to my wife, Erica. I mean, she's been the backbone of this whole deal. And she encourages me to chase my passions. And it's more than a hobby, as we, we both know. And so she's just been we like, we both like to see each other happy and fulfilled. And so she's got things that she loves to do and she's an incredible mom and wife. And she knows that when I get to pursue these things like hunting land that, I mean, it charges my battery and I come back home ready to, ready to roll, ready to go to work. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've been on the same page, man. Our second date, we went bass fishing together and I made it pretty, like we were, we've been on this. She loves this stuff too. She, with having four kids at our ages, we don't get to do it together as much as we used to, but she's, she enjoys this stuff as well. Uh, and so we've been, we've been lockstep together and she's, you know, she was just as excited as I was to, to buy a piece of ground and was at the closing table. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. With a, with a fresh newborn. Yeah, that's right. June was, <laughs> she was, she was, what was it? she was 21 days old at yeah. the closing table. <laughs> that's fresh. <laughs> oh that's, yeah. That's she slept awesome. the whole time. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. But, She's, I mean, Erica is, yeah, I can't say, yeah, I love you, babe. I can't say enough good things about just being on the same page together on it. So, yeah, I think that's so cool. I, in when, when a significant other supports something like this, because I think the idea of buying land is kind of obscure, especially if you don't come from any background or you think like, why would you want to own, why would you want to own ground or, or, um, I get this even talking to different types of people that don't understand recreational ground or like the inherent value to it. And like, why would anyone buy it? I was like, well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's not as good as an investment, maybe a straight tillable or commercial, but there, it's still an investment, and there's a lot of, in, you know, intrinsic value in terms of enjoyment. And they just look at you like you're crazy, and uh, probably, once, probably yes, but <laughs> well, nobody doubts that we're crazy. I mean, that's, I think that's part of why we chase this as hard as we do, and a little bit of crazy. Uh-huh. But once we both realized, it started with me realizing it, and then articulating it to my wife that this actually makes financial sense. And yeah, a balloon loan, five-year balloon loan at the rate we got does no, not something I would normally do, and certainly not Dave Ramsey approved. I think you can adjust yep. to that. Yep. But, but long term, I think it also makes financial sense. I can't take money out of my, I can't take my four hundred one k or my IRA and go take my son Jack hunting for the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And so it's just another way that we realized we could diversify our, like our long-term financial strategy, and mm-hmm. and tuck some of this money that would otherwise go into an account for somebody else to manage for us into something that we can improve. And if we break even and decide that this is not for us, oh, well, like we'll, you know, we'll go, we'll go from there a hundred percent. And so once we, I realized that it made financial sense uh, for the most part, uh, if you buy right and do some of those things that you've coached me on, then mm-hmm. it was, it became even more of a no brainer for us. So mm-hmm. let me disclaimer this whole thing. I closed on May 31st. So like all of this, I'm as gr- if I sound hypothetical, like confident, <laughs> if I sound confident, like I know what I'm doing, I don't. Um, I, let's let's do this in three years, and you can be like, all right, you were real confident three years ago. What uh, does it look like today? today? Yeah, <laughs> we, absolutely. We'll definitely have to do that. I, and I think um, I think that's a that's a fair disclaimer for sure. And I think uh, yeah, 
that's that's part of the fun of some of these episodes because it's so fresh and, and exciting. But I, I really do think that over okay, let's just jump forward three years from now. If you sure. do the inter- incremental projects that you're t- you're planning to do, mm-hmm. the market should appreciate over a three year span. I mean, I think this is a this is a Dave Ramsey stat or something along those lines that the market over any five year period has never gone down. Yeah, I think. And so I think land. I don't know the actual fact, but it's got to be pretty close to that. And maybe it's a seven year period. And that probably doesn't take into account buying right and buying under market and then being close to a metro and being able to add value to it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I, that's one of the exciting things about land too, is like you have the ability to improve the investment with your own bare hands or your own mind of whether you're telling someone that, you know, do it with the equipment. And I, that's, that's where stocks get really boring. <laughs> Mutual funds get oh, really man. boring because it's just, you read the news and you're like, oh man, this sucks. And with Lance, like, all right, here's a problem. Go fix it. Yeah. And, and you, if you, you have can, the ability to do it. Yeah. If you can like do it all right. Like, like thank the Lord that we're able to invest in, you know, mutual funds, all those things, but then also land. So if you're able to do both things, why not cast a wide net and diversify as much as possible as way I see it. If you're, if you're able to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's definitely fair. Now talking about the, the financing side of things, what was that process? What did that process look like? Because I know you feel like you got a high interest rate, but go, go call Al, go call Alec and quote him again and see what it would be today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I thought I was at the, at the highest point, uh, you know, but try to guess the market. It doesn't go well. Uh, yeah, it was pretty seamless. And thanks to you for recommending, you know, hooking me up with Alec. And he he was great to work with and didn't overpromise, but also uh, was somebody who I could tell had done this before. And just the same thing, he they weren't afraid to loan or to lend to guys who were just doing rec ground. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like a family farm or a house purchase. And so it was it was really simple. Uh, just, you know, got in my financial statements and our situation and hey here's what we're looking at what what can we afford and he had a pre-approval turned around within the week of getting yeah. him all those documents that we had and then it was just a a matter of you know moving towards closing and he i was hoping that uh you know oh a balloon loan or an adjustable rate mortgage wasn't going to be the route we had to go but after he talked to me through all the options um i realized that that for us right now a five-year balloon was actually i still think it was the best case scenario in the moment Um, why is that why is that in your opinion well a traditional mortgage for like a a, you know a 15 or a 30 or even in between was the the interest rate was going to be even higher than that and so up near you know eight plus percent and so we locked in at six and a half percent for a five-year balloon and then just knowing the context of what my wife and i want to do so we're probably going to move out of the house that i'm recording this in and the current plan is to take the equity from this house and, and pay off the farm. And uh, if we keep having kids, that's going to happen probably sooner than, than later, Lord willing. Uh, uh-huh. And so I don't plan on, you know, again, like re- hopefully this happens. I don't plan on having this loan up until the, the maturation date of it five years from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I think we'll be able to get out of it. Um, and if not, then obviously selling becomes, you got to have an exit strategy. So parachute. Plan. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I even think uh, beyond that too, if, if rates do go down and, you know, let's say yeah. four years and six months, then you can just refinance and then you could get a 15 year potentially, um, which yeah, um, I've, I read a bunch of different stuff and I know interest rates are at the top of, that, top of everyone's mind, but they, they think probably 2024 will be the first time before we start seeing rates, you know, uh, retreat back to something I mean, I, they're not, they're not going to get back down 3%. I'll tell you that, but no, <laughs> where they no. retreat to uh, five and a half or six. Yeah. And obviously every situation is different, but Alec, Alec was great. And I've, I've high degree of confidence that we can refi. Um, and that, you know, there's no prepayment penalty with the product that I have and ability to refi for a small fee. Uh, so well, yeah, let, if it makes sense, I'll do it. Let me ask you this. Cause I think you probably asked a lot of good questions when you're, uh, talking with that bank, what are some, what's some advice that you would tell someone else that these are the questions I asked that I think were helpful for me to make a decision on, on the institution I worked with? Man, well, I listened to all the episodes on this. And so I felt like I had a major cheat code (laughs) and I didn't shop lenders like everybody tells you to do. 
Uh-huh. I, Alec and I clicked and, you, you know, I, I'm in a comfortable spot. So I, I didn't feel like I had to nickel and dime to get to, oh, well, this guy's offering me six and a quarter. Mm-hmm. I, I just asked all the questions of like, hey, if rates go up to 10% and, you know, it's the end of this five-year balloon, is there a negotiation phase? And there is. Okay, if I, you know, want to pay this off with home equity from our sale, is there a prepayment penalty? No, there's not. Uh, is there option to refinance? Yes, there is. And so just, I kind of go to the worst case scenarios in my mind. That's generally how I operate. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I kind of back into it from there. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, well, what happens if I lose my job or what happens if, you know, people no longer want to eat in restaurants? Okay. Well, <laughs> I, what's my exit strategy, right? Okay. Well, uh-huh. I can pay it off without a penalty. And I, it's a, we bought it right. And I think we could flip it if need be. Mm-hmm. Then there, the fear was gone. And so mm-hmm. I went to the worst case in my mind and asked all the accompanying questions of that. And then at the other side of it realized like, okay, I still want to do this. I'm comfortable with it. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that's a, that's a healthy thought exercise to, to understand, okay, what are all these options and what is like plan X, Y, Z, you know, I think, actually you get through ABC. Yeah. I think the important thing to mention also is like, you've got to almost block out the excitement of the purchase Sure. because it can be an emo- and it still is an emotional thing and it should be because it's a dream come true and it's something we're passionate about. But I had to block out the emotion of I really want this piece of ground, but I'm not going to buy it if it doesn't make at least a little bit of financial sense. Mm-hmm. And so that just goes back to like, are you, are you putting your family first as a priority? Are you putting deer hunting above your family, et cetera? Mm-hmm. What, um, what's a piece of advice you'd give someone that is looking to buy their first piece of ground? And I know this is, this is still kind of fresh to you, but uh, that the freshness may be good. Uh, ask me in three years. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got three things that uh, helped me in the, and this is honestly the first two are just like life principles that I try to live by. Keep a loose grip on the whole process. And so there'll, there'll always be another piece. And so keep a loose grip. We, the fact that I'm able to buy land is a blessing and it's a want, not a need. And so keeping that in perspective of like, I get to do this. Mm-hmm. And so very loose grip. And if it happens, it happens. Secondly, I seek wise counsel uh, in, in all areas of life. And that's you, Jake. That's my wife. Appreciate. That's my, my Georgia buddies. That's other podcasts. That's, uh, Alec. That's my dad, my mom and seeking, seeking wise counsel and vetting some of those ideas. And sometimes people won't get it. Right. And so you have to kind of block some of that noise out of like, they just, they don't have the motor that I have for, for deer hunting. Mm-hmm. And so seek wise counsel. And then thirdly, get in the game. And if it, if it's not going to sink you financially, just do it. Uh, yeah. And you always hear guys say time in the market beats timing the market. And so I'm just hijacking something I heard on a podcast there, but it's like, I, I knew that I needed to do that and we did it. So, yeah, I, I think that's one of the best, uh, uh, t- time in the market versus time in the market, I think is probably one of the most impactful quotes that like, even as this starting like a Roth IRA and yeah. I had, I was sitting on, I was like, Oh, you know, should I wait for them? You know, I read this headline that, <laughs> you know, this is like 2018 before the market just rant, rant, rallied up. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, do I need to be patient? Do I need to do this? And then I just, uh, it was like something I was like, all right, just dollar cost average, just, just do it. And I think for that's, sure. uh, that's what you have to do is like just getting started and sticking to a plan is, really the hardest part um investing or even buying land i think and that's just my uh my perception right now at this point you know this stage of my life but i've also had the ability to talk to people that have done this for a long time and i think overall yes there's market cycles absolutely and anything there is but timing or time in it first timing is going to win long term yeah and let's be honest like if we if we didn't dump some of our money into land like i'm just gonna buy too many trail cameras and (laughs) you know probably spend it on things related to hunting for my permission properties that like why not put it towards something that my kids can enjoy and potentially become part of the inheritance and and all that good stuff that's another part of the equation that we're excited about yeah for sure so do you think that by having having that specific goal helps you refocus dollars because that's kind of what you mentioned there it's like you could financially do it and then if not that money hypothetically kind of would have evaporated anyways into different things but this is like i have a specific thing to focus on right now yeah for sure uh and, and it i mean this is like one of the best things you, it's it, it happens automatically it's coming out so you better be ready for it like your checking account or savings account better be ready for that hit and, and on the seventh of the month or whenever it comes out and so 
it forces you to become more organized and more structured and plan for that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't have a choice. I have to pay it. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> ready or not, it's going to be deposits there. coming out. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's funny. What was, uh, what were some resources that helped you along the way? I know you mentioned the land podcast and some other podcasts. Was there any, was there like any family friends or someone else that you know that had bought land in the past? That's like kind of gave you a, a verbal <sighs> blessing. No, honestly, really? Uh, I don't come from a family who hunts a little bit of fishing growing up. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I know anybody who's bought a piece of ground for hunting purposes. And so, Dang, so that, that's so foreign to you. So what was that like talking to yeah. your family then? I mean, obviously your wife was on board, but like, what did your dad say? Man, like, they know crazy? how many, Yeah. Well, I've been crazy <laughs> about this. I mean, I've been over the top into uh-huh. hunting since I was 13 and shot my first doe. I mean, th- there was no surprise to them uh-huh. and they were, you know, there's nothing they could have said or done that would have talked me out of it anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But my parents are very wise and, um, you know, just made sure that it made financial sense. I think was my dad's encouragement and that it wasn't going to, you know, screw us over long-term and that there was an exit strategy. Obviously my wife, my goodness. Yeah. Again, super thankful for her support. And then my, my buddies from Georgia who I can't tell you how many links from <laughs> land watch or, are they scouring Illinois listings all Dude, the time up here? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much they're scouring them. My buddy Caleb for sure scours them. They just are the recipients of links to farms. And I think they just have been, like some of them probably just got tired of Oh, you're sending oh, them yeah. links all the time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one. This is two and a half hours away. Looks like the genetics are great. Cool, man. Like, are you gonna go walk it? You know, <laughs> they tired. But no, they were a big help because uh, they really did send their feedback back on it or on, yeah. on each piece that I sent them. And certainly as soon as we got serious about this farm, uh, I feel like I made the decision with those guys. Ever. I mean, that's cool. as things happened with you, I mean, I was te- texting those guys updates mm-hmm. and that just speaks to the relationship that we have with those guys, Caleb, Caleb, Chris and Kevin, shout out to you guys and helping me, helping me get the plane off the ground with this farm. Yeah. Uh, well, real quick though. So when you're, when you're trying to assess a listing, cause there's a, this is always the like the double-edged sword, right? Okay, so there's one listing that shows there's giant deer. Oh, there's nice food plots that are already carved out. Oh, there's already a couple box blinds on there. That's really nice. Yeah. And then the inverse is like the farm that you ended up buying where there's not a single deer picture. We we asked the listing agent, he's like, Ah, he hunted it, but I don't really know. And I don't wanna like I don't like I'm not gonna ask you. <laughs> so Perfect. it's like the polar opposite of the two. Obviously, one of them is higher risk with higher reward, the other one is like yeah wow, there's uh, some instant gratification the moment you potentially buy it. So what, where does that balance go for you? Oh, I think it needs to be said, first of all, that I just like looking at land listings. And so oh, yeah. sometimes I'm just sending hit my buddies like, dude, check this out. This someday, is sweet farm. You know, yeah. <laughs> someday. And it's like, okay, back to work. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, I'm look, that's, those are not the ones I want to buy, right? Like I don't want the turnkey piece that's 6500 an acre in a $4,500 an acre area, mm-hmm. okay? the ones that are, and we know those groups that do a great job doing that. And that's, I love that. You know, we hope to be those guys, right. When we sell, uh, but I'm looking for something that the owner or the agent doesn't know that there's rec land and hunting and they don't know what a 140 is and what a booner is like, that's, I want them as ignorant as possible to the potential there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, there's farms that you send to your buddies because you're like, man, this is awesome. And then there's farms that say, hey, like I sent them probably a handful that like, hey, this is re- like, this might actually be a good deal that I could buy right and have some instant equity mm-hmm. in the deal. Yeah. I, it, the anticipation of walking the ones that, you know, aren't necessarily marketed that well is yeah. so fun too, because it's like, Ooh, I wonder what it is. Like, it's a, uh, to me, it feels like I was talking to C pants in this past weekend when I was out there and I said, do you remember the show American pickers where they like show up to a random place <laughs> and they like find this gold mine? Like, that's how I feel when I go walk farms. It's like, all right, we're, we're American pickers here. No, let's see what we have here. And, uh, that, that process is addicting truth, truthfully. Fall in love with every farm I walk on, man. Me too. Uh, and the other thing is like time of year makes a big difference. So, oh, yeah. you know, Good I walked that farm in December after a pretty legit snow and that honestly like hurt hurt the process and there were some tracks and this and that and i could tell there's some deer traveling it but when we walked it in march and i could see there were some All remnant scrapes left yep. over but yep. rubs everywhere and the ice had melted i was like dang like this place is kind of tore up back here yeah what um what are some of the first projects because i know you put in some food plots here this year 
or you're in the process of doing that, what, what are some year one projects that you're tackling? Um, yeah. So we just sprayed, I just sprayed about a half acre of plots. Uh, there will be standing corn on it this year. So I've, I've talked with the farmer a couple of times and um, we're going to leave some farm up or some corn up strategically and put a blind kind of in between two fields. And How much do you think you'll put up or leave up? Oh man, it's a good question for you. I was thinking <laughs> one to two, one to two acres probably. I would, I would do two for sure. Okay. I don't, think, I don't think one would be enough. Yeah. And it's so close to the neighbors. So I'm, I'm looking for that corn to also shield from the neighbors too. And also obviously be a, a place to shoot a deer coming or go into it. So, mm-hmm. uh, but I will say this, like trail camera pictures is like, I'm trying to get as many trail camera pictures as possible for a future sale. Mm-hmm. Uh, but from a habitat standpoint, uh, plots, so half acre of kill plots just tucked into the timber right there that have pretty good access for north and west and south winds, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, that's most of your winds, right? Yep. And then uh, I've talked with the CRP guy for the county, and we're going to walk it soon um, with a Pheasants Forever guy who's a big deer nut as well. Mm-hmm. and see if crp makes sense uh because with the, the upper field or i guess it's the lower field on the north floods a lot mm-hmm. and so we might do a tree crp program maybe just a general crp i'm not sure what it's i know that it's eligible it's got harvest it's got a the crop it's got harvest data yep. yeah crop yep. records so yep. we got that for sure so i know we can get it into crp i plan to have a somebody out there a forester come out probably i don't know you tell me january or february yeah i mean to, to just get one out there when you can okay gotcha <laughs> because they're, hard to, they're hard to track down i uh I, I got equipped for uh one of the parcels and i sent them that got funded in march and uh i okay. emailed a bunch of foresters and there's there's one he'll be too far south for where you're at but um he's like i'll try to get out there this summer and i've sent him an email every month like hey <laughs> I don't want you out there in October or November. I know that. I do not. That's for sure. Never. So I would just say whenever, whenever you can. But um, all, all those are all excellent, all excellent things because those are all free resources that um, are very pa- like they're not in that job to make a lot of money. They they do that job because they're passionate about habitat, wildlife, mm-hmm. and uh, they'll geek out on your farm just like you know you do. So um, those are all really important things. And I think that. So would you leave the other field? And potentially row crop production still, or would you consider putting that into food or what, what's your plan there? You know, I'm not sure this year, I'm not going to change much. So we're going to put in kill plots and we're going to leave some corn up, but that's all we're going to do. Uh, you know, I don't want to change too much. We want to hunt it. And biggest thing I'm going to do is try to not pressure it a ton and, and lean on my permission properties. If, if you really got the itch, you know, on a terrible sure. South wind when it's 80 degrees in October, yep. probably don't go to your best spot. Mm-hmm. And so going to lean on my permission spots to scratch the itch on those days. Uh, but yeah, I think I need to leave some ag up probably. But when I look at the, when I look at the area, man, there's so much corn and beans around mm-hmm. and like, I want my, I want my piece to be different and differentiate itself. So I, I, my gut is telling me I want to do CRP on like as much of it as possible and then leave up two acres of standing ag, whether that's beans or corn. Mm-hmm. and then kill plots and then potentially we've got a whole bunch of invasive trees like just uh west of that stand of red oaks yeah um i mean it's a giant patch it's probably four acres i'm mm-hmm. just like it seems to me like useless i don't know exactly what they are but really high stem count saplings mm-hmm. and so potentially uh ripping some of that out and putting like a little hidden standing ag plot seems mm-hmm. like a killer idea to me but. Yeah, I, 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 that would be something I would definitely consider. Um, <clears throat> it, can you remind me, or was that field to the south it would be, right? That Was that chisel plowed when we walked that? I can't remember now. I think so, because the deer, we jumped those like 11 does or analyst yeah. deer. They jumped out of those oaks and ran right across it. And I, I think I remember it being chisel plowed. So that's yeah. another, thanks for the reminder. Yeah, that's, so that, that's, that's what I'm the saying. same farmer. Yeah. Same guy who runs. Oh, that's chisel pliers. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, ask me in three years. Yeah. Chisel plow in 2023. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, and that's just part of the, pro- like being aware that you're going to learn stuff along. I mean, no one knows everything and every, everyone is always constantly learning. So that's the one thing I bring up though, is like if everything's getting chisel pot around for late season, then oh. really there's not going to be much food in those. So if, if you don't, if you, let's say you left that whole field and, uh, tillable still you leave two acres standing and then not have them chisel plow then you're going to have the bulk of the food for sure yeah and that's a strong vote for leaving it in tillable i think my only issue is the neighbors are really close and i like uncomfortably close and so i need to 
whether that's a screen with wheat or whether it's some bedding blend, but also the road's kind of close on the upper field as well. And so mm-hmm. the reason CRP is appealing to me is just, I want to make it feel remote. I want to make it feel sheltered and safe for the deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this year for sure, like, I, I, you know, the cash run agreement is in place. So there's nothing I can do anyways. So we're going to, we're going to try the ag thing this year. Mm-hmm. And then I think the earliest I could get CRP would be in One October. Year. Yeah. It'd be an October, 2024 agreement based on the, the conversation. And so, which mm-hmm. means that I won't plan until, you know, March or April, 2025. So mm-hmm. I'm probably looking at two years of tillable and then potentially mm-hmm. a CRP deal. So, yep. and and then uh, with that being corn this year, it'll be beans next year. And then you could easily yep. drill into that uh, for 2020, uh, spring of 2025, which is a really good, really, really good strategy for that. Um, okay. What, uh, yeah, I th- I'm, I'm just excited for you, man. I really am because I felt like, you know, to, to kind of be in communication with you for over a year and like following yeah. along and looking at all these different parcels and like breaking them down mutually and, you know, bouncing back ideas and then to, to settle on one that I, I still hop up in that County. I mean, I'm looking everywhere and it's like, yeah, it just continues to solidify. Like you got a, you did really good. on it. There's not many farms available, man. And one, one went for like, I want to say it was like North of nine K an acre and it had a lot of tilling on it, but it just, you know, it, it kind of made, it made me feel good about like, wow, like I think I did get a good deal. And I remember telling you over the course of the year, like, hey, man, I, I promise I'm not wasting your time. Like, stick with me. It might not <laughs> no, be I, this year. I promise. <laughs> well, I, I'm as addicted to the process as anyone. So, I, yeah. I you know, I, tr- I truly enjoy that. And I, and I would say as far as being respectful of other people's time, like, I can tell that you are extremely thoughtful with all communication and how you handle yourself. And so, like, it was truly a pleasure to work with you because, um, like, to awesome. people that understand that um, – to understand other people's time is valuable. Like, obviously, it's my job to help people, but uh, you were just extremely transparent throughout the entire process. And I felt like this guy isn't feeding me a line of crap. Like, he's like he's being transparent, top to bottom. Oh, yeah, man. It's like it goes back to this. Like, we get to do this, right? Like, we're like, I am blessed enough to be able to buy land. And so, like, I want to represent myself well, represent my family well, the people who I work with well. And that starts with text messages, emails, phone calls, and like your reputation you know, is easy to lose. So in, in a moment, so keep a loose grip on, keep a loose grip on every situation and represent yourself. Well, mm-hmm. what was the common myth about the purchasing process up to, up to this point that you were like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Or you think that a lot of people just don't consider this or whatever the case may be. Yeah. I think that, I think that chapter is still being written, but one, one that came up was the idea that you missed out on the farm that you were supposed to buy. Mm-hmm. Oh, you missed it. You could have gotten a three and a half percent, 30 year fixed on that piece of ground up in, you know, Carroll County that we looked at. Oh, that's gone. Shoot. I'm kicking myself. And the next thing you know, you're sending your buddy another link from Landwatch. that's like, oh, this, this checks the boxes. Mm-hmm. And so just the fact, the myth of like you missed out and the anecdote would be like, there's always another property mm-hmm. uh, and you can miss deals, obviously. Sure. But there will always be another property. And I found that to be encouraging. Just turn the page, go to bed, hit it again tomorrow. Yep. So, yeah, I think um, that's an excellent point because I think a lot of just general successful people, no matter what it is, and just from talking to different people from all walks of life, they all have the abundance mindset. There's enough for everyone. And whether that's factual or not, I think just having that mindset yeah. of abundance is is the way to do it. Like it's not a scarcity. Other people can win and it doesn't take anything away from you. Like there's there's plenty Amen. for everyone. Amen. Absolutely. And like, I'm just as hyped up to share this property with my buddies and, you know, hopefully we're not shooting two and a half year old, you know, (laughs) one fifteens out there. But if that's my buddy's first buck, Uh Hey, like, well, that was, that was another interesting thing uh, walking with you because you were, you were obviously excited to buy for yourself, but I could see the passion of you wanting to introduce other people and and take other people out and like share the full experience, which um, admittedly I'm more selfish than that. Like I'll tell you right now, I, I'm truly more selfish than that. I have the awareness to say that. Um, and I, I admired that about you cause you're, you're like, I probably get when I'm walking, like if I'm, if I was buying that farmer, I'd be thinking like about myself to be completely honest. <laughs> and, and we're walking that, like you kept bringing that up. I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty unique with compared to a lot of the people that I deal with. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's room for that. And there's a lot of days when I go out, you know, first week of November or whatever, it's game time. And I'm not going to go stopping in there with everybody in my life who wants to hunt. But especially my kids, man, like kids can shoot whatever the heck they want. Right. And I love teaching other people who don't know how to hunt 
how to hunt or even just taking them out. I believe that every, like in every guy, there's, there's a latent desire somewhere to get outside and do some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they might not be in a killing deer, but man, I've never taken someone out there who wasn't like, okay, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. There's a deer 30 yards away. doesn't know I'm there. Yeah. Holy cow. And I love taking people out there and showing them what I already know is the coolest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Any other misconceptions or anything that you found along the way? Uh, Cause you know, I, you're, you're pretty well read. I mean, you're pretty uh, self-educated on this process. You seeked out a lot of information. Could you imagine um, jumping a time machine 10 years ago or 15 years ago, like before all this information was available? I mean, that's something I think we all take for granted of how yeah. much good information is out there now never would have done it without the resources and going to the dark place of like, what's the worst case scenario? What's my parachute plan? I don't make any decision without going to the, okay, what, you know, the Oh crap moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What am I going to do? And then I back into it from there. And Mm -hmm. so, and it was still viable at the end of that, I guess, mental exercise. So Mm -hmm. what, uh, do you think this would be the last piece, the last piece of ground you own? Or do you think there's more in the future? Yeah, no way. You're related to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got the bug. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'm going to, you know, be in a Scalma situation where he's got, you know, four or five pieces and it's like, <laughs> you know, hey, babe, like, you know, you know, I'm, you know, we're going to make an off. offer tonight. I don't think so. I think I'm more going to be along the, the lines of like the 1031 snowball. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I could see us improving this piece uh, and then. 1031 exchanging it into the next piece and selling it to somebody maybe a chicago guy who doesn't have the time but his kid all of a sudden wants to go hunting and he's like well this is 45 minutes away and it looks like look it's got a nice blind out there for us and a couple double sets and oh my goodness like let's let's do that and so i could see us 1031 exchanging into the next piece eventually jake having lodging on the piece is mm-hmm. the end goal and having like mm-hmm. a little getaway spot for me and my kids and my wife, mm-hmm. 45 minutes away. There's really no need for a cabin out there. Sure. It's like we can be back to our, our place in 45 minutes, but being yeah. up towards Joe Davies, Carol up there in the Hills, I think mm-hmm. is probably my end goal mm-hmm. uh, with a cabin on it. Um, it's a beautiful country over there. there. It's really oh, beautiful yeah. over there. Good deer and density. It doesn't feel like Illinois when you get up that no. way. Iowa baby. Wisconsin. Yeah, that's, that's what it feels like. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It really, it really does. Well, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you do want to share? Like I said, we've, I've owned this place for like two months. So. <laughs> it's fresh. Well, grain of, grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. I do want to, I do want to talk about like the, the boomerang of this deal. If you're open to that. Yeah, sure. So we, we walk it and this piece had sat in the market for a very long time. And then I say, hey, we're getting ready to put an offer in. And we ended up submitting an offer, correct? And he's like, well, there might be someone else that's interested. And so this landowner was considering to sell because it was already served. Part of it was already surveyed too when we walked it. It looked like the tillable part was surveyed. So we put an offer in and then, and I'll let you tell the story from there. Yeah. So we put in an offer that I wouldn't call it a lowball offer. It was a respectful offer, but it was, man, if we had, if we had got it for, you know, are we going to share numbers on here? Uh, it's up to you. <laughs> All right, if we if we had got it for th- you know for three fifteen, I mean, goodness gracious, talk about instant equity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought we had a really good chance there because it's been on the market for over a hundred days, maybe more than that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh my gosh, if we get if we if we lock this up for this price, goodness gracious. Um, and then out of nowhere, and this again, this was the most craziest thing. You were like, Phil, this is disappointing. Uh, apparently, a cash offer just came in out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, like they want to know if you're, yeah. And like, I was floored and I was super disappointed, but again, like kind of, you know, got over it and loose grip mentality, honestly, but that came out of nowhere and was a major bummer. And then we just hung tight for, was it a week later? It might've been even longer than that. And the, the listening agent said, you know, you know, crazier things have happened. If this, you know, this may fall apart. Well, if it does fall apart for whatever reason, there's an inkling that it's going to fall apart. Call me back. Okay. Yes. That reminds me. I've made a mistake in this process. This is probably great for listeners. So as soon as I heard there was a cash offer and they were going to accept it, I remember asking you, Hey, can I write them a letter and like, try to like, you know, tug at the heartstrings. And that's exactly what we did. I wrote them a letter, uh, with, you know, honest open letter about Mm -hmm. why I wanted the piece. It's proximity to my buddy. Uh, my wife and I got engaged a mile away during college a picture of the family, my intentions with the property, this, that, and the other. 
And I, after I wrote that thing, man, I like dropped my pen. I'm like, if this guy, if this doesn't get through to this guy, <laughs> like th- that's all I got, man. Yeah, like, this is ev- hard on the sleeve. Everything I got. <laughs> take is empty, man. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So I think that helped with the loose grip, uh, I guess, mindset of it. And then uh, I think you sent back from the agent. He appreciated the letter, but unfortunately they were going to uh, accept the cash offer. And so then it was like, all right. And the problem was, here's the mistake I made, Jake. I think I said, hey, let's put in another offer at matching asking price. Or no, I think we I think we did like a thousand dollars over ask. Yeah. Is which you verify it, that. It was, yeah, it was something along those lines. And uh because I was like at that point it was still a good buy by all regards. Sure. And it's like yeah. in you know, it checked off all the boxes. And so I think we're we were willing to to do what we could. And, yep. I, but that was a moment where the emotion took over in this yep. whole process. I've sounded like, oh, I've done this with such methodical. Wisdom. Yeah, man. No, the emotion took over in that moment. And I was like, I'm, I'm a, here's a Hail Mary, like last chance. Let's go 1000 over asking. And then so when the deal fell through, because then the deal did fall through Correct. the cash offer that was apparently bulletproof. And we can get into that as well. But well, this is this is kind of what from my perspective, and obviously, I, I'm, I'm removed from from that situation. But from my perspective, it was sure. that most contracts have a, an attorney review. And basically what that means mm-hmm. is there's a certain amount of days that a buyer's attorney and seller's attorney can review the offer and then they can, you know, amend anything and obviously has to get approved by both sides. But it sounded like the other side attorney during that attorney review, they didn't like anything. And what that really does in reality is it kind of gives people five days to think. <laughs> I mean, any attorney can come up with any reason why uh, it's not, you know, viable to proceed. And that's kind of what I think happened there. And then, so I'll let you take from there. Yeah. I've been there on the residential side of things on the other side of that. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah. So then I was sitting in church with my wife and looked at my phone and there was a message, a text from you. Hey, are you still interested in, in this piece? I'm like, like I said, started sweating, showed it to my wife. <laughs> yes, Jake, we are. And so then it was, then the question was, okay, well, do we just resubmit our offer that's 1000 over asking or we kind of had some leverage because all of a sudden we're the only game in town. Yep. So then we decided to make a competitive offer above the first initial offer, but not to asking. Mm-hmm. And so kind of came in, I, in between. I, I think we kind of framed that as like, this is the, this is the final and best the situation has changed. Um, seller wants to, cause then that, then I think once emotions kind of fell back yeah. and you're like you gotta uh, and that was kind of my suggestion it's like let's just do this i think they're gonna be crazy if they don't take this and, th- and that's ultimately what happened you still got it below list for a very competitive offer yeah i think i i think i offered uh 330 and then they countered at 340 and i was i wasn't gonna try to play the well meet me at 335 i didn't mm-hmm. want to chase them off mm-hmm. it was just based on advice on this podcast of like hey when it when you're within are you gonna lose a deal over 5k like mm-hmm. probably not. It's early in the game to say you did good, but my gut feeling <laughs> is you did good. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I just appreciate the opportunity and what you're doing on this podcast, and I'm excited to be on that uh, that list of a hundred. So absolutely, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else here? No. Grateful to my wife. Grateful to my family. <laughs> my buddies back home in Georgia, and Dave, and all those people that listen to me that I probably drove crazy with this process. Um, <laughs> I'm ready to be sitting behind a deer behind it though. I got to be honest. 